This topic that we're going to attempt to talk about is what I believe the main contributing factor to why children are seemingly so much faster and better at learning than adults. I can't prove it, I'm not 100% positive, but if I had to bet money, it would be this weird little thing. And it will probably take the whole episode for us to try to explain it. But the idea is this, that our brains look for answers in places that they think they will be. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> which it's like, okay, well, yeah, sure. But it, here's an example to try to describe this. Um, if you teach a child three notes on a piano, and then you say, make up a song with those three notes, they'll go, okay, cool. And then they'll just start making a song with those three notes. They'll play them in all di different orders and whatever. It might be a song that no one ever wants to listen to. It might sound terrible, but to them, they'll have fun and they will just write a song right away. Mm -hmm. If you tell an adult to write a song with these three notes that you just taught to them, they will say, uh, well, let me practice it in, and next week I'll, I'll, I'll play some next week. All right. Uh, can we, can we do that? Or, or, yeah. oh, well, I don't know how to write a song. Uh, you know, I, I need to research songwriting. You know, I, I need to learn how to go write a song or, uh, I, I got to practice these three notes. It just, I don't know how to do it. Uh, whatever. And they'll just go on and on. I don't, I don't know music theory. I don't know enough to blah, blah, blah. They will come up with every excuse in the book to not play the song. Can confirm. And yeah, you, yeah, please back me up on this. Cause I know you've taught a <laughs> yeah, lot of people. hundred percent. Um, but I think what's happening is the adult, when they're given this riddle of, you know, how do you write a song or can you please write a song? Their brain goes, okay, the answer to this lies in some sort of external thing, some sort of biblical truth of right or wrong. Other people know this secret, but I don't know the secret. The secret to being able to write a song lies in music theory, or it lies in the ability to play these notes faster, or it lies in me practicing this week, or it, it lies in some external figment of truth outside of of oneself outside of me. Whereas the child, you say, play, you know, make up a song and they say, okay. And then they just do it mm -hmm. because they do the only thing they know how, which is just to do it. Whatever knowledge they have right then is the, the only solution to the problem. They don't have a second thought as to what's right or wrong. They only have what they instinctually know or have learned before. That's it. That's the only place that the brain looks for the solution to the problem. And now, of course, this is two sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think we're all different for different subjects, for different stages of life. And we're, we're all kind of both of these things. Mm -hmm. But, well, I've started to notice this in me and many other people. But before we get too far, I, I think this concept is so extremely closely related to a topic we talked about at the very beginning of the show, or at the very beginning of, of this podcast, uh, called the, the first one in the game effect, which is something that, that you came up with, or you observed. And so I think before we talk any more about this, I want... I wanted Michael to kind of give a review on what the first one in the game effect is, because I think they're they're so closely tied that the, I don't know, the terminology from first one in the game effect might help us out in describing this a little bit better. So please give us okay. a review of that. <laughs> I first would just like to note that even though this was one of the very first things we really talked about, I still remember it and still think about it pretty often. And I mm -hmm. think it's because it has a good name. And there's other concepts that we've come up with that are probably just as important and just, impa just as impactful. And we weren't able to give them a very good name. And so we forgot about them. And I don't, I don't know what that means. That's just an observation. But yeah. No, 
of course I remember the first one in the game effect. It's Agreed. a pretty good name. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this was just something I observed um, literally from playing games where if me and a few friends said, hey, Thursday night, let's play this new game. We're going to play Stardew Valley. None of us have played it before. Or we're going to play Terraria or Don't Starve. One of those, you know, bunch of people co-op games. What would typically happen is Thursday night rolls around. Some of us are making dinner, trying to wrap things up. You know, maybe maybe one of us kind of gets in, gets started first. Download the game and inevitably somebody's the first one in the game. So maybe they're there for 15 minutes. It doesn't need to be very long at all. But the first one there, when they're in the game, there's there's nobody to talk to, nobody to ask questions to. So if you need to figure something out, you figure it out. There's there's never a question mark in your mind because there's no other alternative. So you simply figure things out. You try stuff, you see if you can shoot things and maybe there's crafting or maybe there isn't or how does the bow work and stuff like you just try it you just figure it out or you're reading tooltips things like that so 10 15 minutes later let's say everybody else kind of gets in they get started they make their character and almost inevitably everyone will begin asking the first one in the game questions like hey how does this work? Um, how do craftables, or should we, can we make a chest? Can we this or that and whatever? Like they just instinctually ask that person questions and that person answers them. And that will often persist indefinitely throughout the entire session and into the next week. And just for weeks, this person who happened to be the first one in the game is the expert, even though they've had the tiniest little bit of a head start. And it'll just stay like that where everyone else is just kind of relying on them to tell them things. That's the first one in the game effect. So it's like the first one in the game realizes that the solutions to all the problems they run into have to come from them sort of driving that problem solving. Yeah. So if they run into a problem, they have to figure it out themselves. The other people come in and they realize that they don't need to find solutions within themselves. All they have to do is sit there and wait for the other person to tell them. And so they never, they never learn that their own brains can solve these problems because they, they technically don't need to. Yeah. Uh, and, you see the correlation? And, or? Yeah, totally. And it's not, I, as far as I'm aware, no one is thinking about this explicitly. No one's like, ooh, I get to be lazy right. and let this person figure it out. It's purely this assumed role. And it it's just the circumstance of how people start the game. And it tends to persist where nobody even realizes that they're thinking this way. You know, the first one in the game doesn't really think about the fact that they're the first one in the game. That's just the role they assume. And so, as you said, if they start out having to find an answer themselves, they just continue to find an answer themselves. They never think, oh, I should rely on someone else. But it's not a conscious thought process. So the way I was thinking about this is if you think of a wolf, right? They're these, you know, fierce, brilliant, strategic, super cool looking creatures that are just phenomenal at hunting and strategizing and they're sure. just brilliant and agile and strong and powerful and whatever. Well, they have to go out and hunt and, and, you know, find their food and track it down and use their brains and work really, really hard to get food. Pretend that a wolf is walking along one day and it comes across the, the back of a restaurant or something. And the cook comes out, sees the wolf and goes, here, have a hamburger. And then walks back inside. The wolf eats the hamburger and then walks away. Well, the next day he comes by, same thing happens. And then he realizes, oh, all I have to do is wait outside of this restaurant and I get a hamburger every day. And then that that's totally fine. That's what That's what a surviving animal should do, take advantage of the situation, uh, you know, get that food while you can. But over time, the wolf gets fat, the wolf, all, all those muscles that it needs 
you know, begin to atrophy, and the wolf just sits there forever. It 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 never utilizes all the all the strengths that it had before. Everything yeah. just starts to decay until it's just this fat like puppy dog sitting at the back of this restaurant. And all the th- all the things that make a wolf so amazing begin to disappear and decay and go away. And then one day, far in the future, the restaurant closes down and the wolf just sits there staring at the back door, just waiting and waiting. It's completely forgotten that it can solve this problem on its own. It knows how to do this. But the brain no longer looks to itself to solve that problem. It looks at the door and just waits and waits until it finally dies. And it's awful. Okay. So well, this is a very sad story metaphor. Thing. Well, you know, humans are in a sad place. Uh, That's fair. And I've watched some of this happen to myself over the years where you get something like a hamburger thrown at you and you're like, awesome, score. This is great. Convenience, efficiency, wonderful. Yeah. But what you don't realize is that the price of that in many cases can be absolutely detrimental to the things that you actually want to do and not that i want to turn this into a a preaching thing but realizing that this way of thinking actually has some extreme downsides uh i think is good to keep in mind i know Uh, i know you won't want to talk about this and i don't either but man that feels a lot like a a chat gpt type of problem really what yeah. even thought of it or you just what could go wrong when you yeah. just sit down and press a button uh yeah for the hamburger over and over and over again for every single aspect of your life well we're, but, we're gonna find out so you don't have to wonder but that makes sense right yeah 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 i get it so the the people coming into the game after that first person they realize that all they have to do is sit there and stare at that door and just wait for the answers. Well, one day when that, the first one in the game leaves and they're no longer there and those people want to continue playing, they have to completely change the way they approach the game. They now have to solve the problems themselves and it's totally different. I think they would find that the way you gather information is very different than just receiving it. So, but, but we're claiming, and, and this is your brainchild, so I'm still kind of along for the ride a little bit. Yeah, and I, I jumped very quickly into a rant already without yeah, really... That's fine. Yeah. Okay. There, the rant comes one way or another. Might as well just get it out there. But we're, we're claiming that this is not the same thing as the first one in the game effect, or at least it's, it's broader, it's, it's somewhat different, right? I think it... It's either very similar or it is the same thing in different different contexts. Okay. Let me give you an example of like a couple different things that I can think of. And I, I think this is related, but you can tell me yay or nay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Well, wait, hold on. I am still trying to figure this out. This is, I've fair. noticed this kind of recently. And looking back on my life, I found a couple other points where I'm thinking, oh, yeah, this is that thing. But I'm still trying to figure it out and wrap my head around it because, you know, you you start thinking that you understand it. And then all of a sudden you include one more example and then you're like, oh, man, I lost it again. So this is me trying to figure out exactly what it is I'm talking about. But yes, that's fair. Please, let's hear it. It it feels like there's something there and we're just trying to kind of get it out and and right figure this out is exploratory yeah. yeah all right i'm into that so two examples i want to give first one and anybody who uses a command line or does any kind of programming will be familiar with this but i'll try and describe it in a way that you would understand if you don't so if you're typing commands on a terminal like you see in the hacker movies and stuff or if you accidentally open the command prompt on your computer you can type stuff in It'll execute a command. Most of the time, it's really simple stuff like, you know, list the files in a directory or change directory or copy a file, stuff like that. So 
the nature of a, a command line prompt is that it's it's just blank like it's waiting for you to put words in and it's very different from what you typically get with a graphical program where the graphical program tries to show you what the options are so you can click on the menu it gives you a drop down you can kind of read what's there you can find the thing you're looking for but it it's trying to prevent or present you with the options and you choose from the options whereas the terminal you have to recall it out of your head and there's a couple little tricks you can get to kind of have it try and help you but for the most part you're having to remember the command for okay how do i copy a file and also preserve permissions or something and then you type it in and whatever so generally it takes a little bit of brain power you got to recall that thing with the graphical program you mostly don't okay so you, you're going along typing stuff and pretty often you will realize oh i need to do this command again like you, you've copied a file and now you got to copy it, the file again or something. So you have two choices. One is you can type it out again. And that requires you to kind of think a little bit, remember it. Or you can press the up arrow or K if you use Vim, whatever. You press the up arrow and it will cycle back through all the commands that you've given. And so as long as you did that sometime in the recent past, you can continuously press the up arrow and you'll keep cycling and cycling. Eventually you'll find that command and be like, ha, there it is. And then you can hit enter and it'll execute it again. As someone who doesn't use the terminal, are you vaguely with me at this point? Yeah. It's like okay. uh, autocorrect on a phone, right? Kind of. Except it you're just the words that you need after you've started. Yeah. You just... Except you're, you're searching in this okay. case. You get it. We get it. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The details don't even really matter here. But what is amusing about this, and I have seen memes to this effect, people make this joke, but sometimes you will be, you'll have the simplest command that you've put in. You know, ls is one of the simplest commands you can do. It just means list, like list all the files. And sometimes you'll find yourself cycling back, like I know I had an ls back here somewhere. And you're like, click, 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 click. And then you find, you find it and you go one pass like crap and you have to go back a little bit and like, cool, enter. And you think, what the hell did I just do? Why did I sit here and scroll back for like a solid 30 seconds to find a command that I could just type? Like, it's not, why? And this happens a lot where instinctually you will search for this thing rather than just engage your brain the tiniest bit and rethink of this command and type it out again right there's there's like a difference between searching for something and thinking of something yes like a really yes well it's actually a big difference but it seems <laughs> it seems small but your brain doesn't want to do like the deep thinking it doesn't want to think right. it wants to find right yes and it's a strange phenomenon because it feels like you're being lazy. And I think in some sense you are, but you're doing a lot more work. Just objectively, it is much harder. If, if you said, hey, would you rather press this button 60 times and then do this thing or type these three letters? You would like, well, the typing the three letters is a lot easier. Like it just, it feels like it's a lot more work. In some sense it is, but it also feels lazy in that you're you're taking the harder lazier path by not engaging your brain in this case even the tiniest amount right okay can i get uh, before we get into it i want to give one more example too yeah, this yeah, i yeah. think makes the laziness a little bit more clear so um i used to go to a powerlifting gym i live at home these days but i used to go to this gym and very often I would, I would do this myself and I would see other people do this too. So you go to do deadlifts and deadlifts are a lift where, especially if you're a power lifter, you tend to lift a lot and the bar is on the ground. Like you have weights, you know, racked onto the bar and it's sitting on the ground. You lift it up, you put it back and you do that however many times you care to do. And then once you're done, you have to unload the bar. So potentially you have, you know, eight plates, four on each side, plus some little ones, stuff like that, that you have to unload. And 
because of the nature of the the weights and the bar sitting on the ground, it can be very difficult to pull the weight off the bar. You know, if you picture yourself trying to grab the weight on the end, you can't just slide it off because it's contacting the ground. So you have to like with one arm lift up part of the bar, which mm -hmm. in this scenario is like 200 pounds plus, and then like slide it out with your arm, but then the weight sort of like it kind of cants itself a little bit where it'll kind of grab the bar so you have to like pull it but keep it lined up straight to where it continues to slide off yeah. also while holding up several hundred pounds and you're already tired because you've been lifting i knew you would find a way to throw in the weight in this metaphor <laughs> it's uh, literally but, about yeah. the weight we get it you're strong okay you should okay if, if this yeah. helps i lift half as much as some people in there so this Whatever. is not a, I'm not trying to humble brag here. I'm trying to describe an annoying situation. Right, Let's continue. pretend there's two plates on there if that's helpful. Whatever. The, the thing is, it's difficult to get the plate off. And so you sit there, like you're struggling. It's heavy. It's awkward. And you're having to like slide. Sometimes it just gets really frustrating. But in the gym, we have this thing called a bar jack. And someone invented it and built it. And then someone at the gym bought it and had it shipped to solve this problem. And it does. And it's very simple. It's it's big. It's like it looks almost like a dolly. It's like that size. It's got a, this big pole sticking up. But you basically you you slide it over, you stick it under the bar, you pull the thing back, and it just lifts the entire thing up off the floor by like a couple inches. And then you can walk over to the end, leisurely, take both hands. You're not having to lift a bar, anything, and just slide the weight off, go walk over, put it back, and you just do this one at a time. And it, it makes this entire situation so much simpler, so much easier, and no one ever does it. And I, I don't really understand why. And I do the same thing where it's like you start, like you, you get done lifting, like, okay, I got to break down the weights. You go grab the weight. You start doing this whole stupid wrestling match, trying to get it off. And you're like, oh, this is frustrating. And you see the bar jack over by the wall and you're just like, no, that's fine. And you just keep struggling. And you'll just go through all the pain of getting this thing off rather than go get the bar jack that's just, you know, it's 15 steps away. Okay, one more example. I know I said two, but I'm thinking of something else that might be more relatable. So this would happen working on my car where I've got a, I've got a wrench, like a little box wrench or something. Maybe it's like not even quite the right size. And I'm reaching around the back of the engine, trying to get a, a bolt out or something, banging up your knuckles. You, there for 10 minutes just cursing and sweating and everything like and i just can't like you almost get it but not quite and like the right wrench is in the toolbox it's right over there you just have to stop put this stupid wrench down go get the little elbow joint and rig it together and use the like the the other ratchet wrench and so many times i would do this where i just finally give up go get the right thing, and then just take the bolt out. And it's just not a big deal. And again, it's like that strange form of, it feels like I'm being lazy, but I'm actually working way harder than I need to. And I don't know if, okay, so to go back to the original thing, I'm not sure if these three examples, if some of them are what you're describing, or maybe none of them are. But this is what has come to my mind. I think that it, it is. The, there might be, the, there's definitely a couple different aspects to this. Yeah. But they are what I'm thinking. Okay. Just in a different context. There are so many times where at work, I will get a prompt to design something. And I go back to my desk and I think, ah, oh, man, I don't have any ideas for this. Ah. I don't really know. And so you just, you right away without even thinking, you get online and you start searching for stuff related to that in hopes that it will inspire you and give you, give you an idea. You go out searching to find an idea, mm -hmm. but actually, and this is what I've been doing the last few months is that I sit there and I think without, without searching to the external world for answers, I just sit there and think, okay, what do I know about this, this prompt or whatever? What do I relate to in this? What do I actually know? And at first you're like, you don't know anything. 
this is totally new. You, you don't know a thing. But then you start breaking through these little barriers. And, and it's kind of frustrating and sort of uncomfortable at first. But then you, you break into that like, deeper part of your brain, the, the deep catacombs of, of your mind. And then, and, and even though it's kind of scary down there and a little bit uncomfortable, then you start finding the really good stuff. And, and ideas start coming to you from deep below these cavernous memories that you have. And that's where the gold is. That's where the true ideas come from. And once I have something that feels really good that I found myself, then I can start looking for, for ideas to support that or for information to build on top of that. And so I, I think the way it relates to, say, your, your car thing or your bench press thing deadlift. is that <laughs> deadlift thing, sorry, your car wrench and your deadlift weight thing. And then the, the computer thing. The... And the computer thing with the terminal mm -hmm. is that in all cases, your brain is trying to search for a solution it the easy one the the really easy solution that that keeps you from having to go deep into your brain and think it, i mean really think and it in your scenarios they are much simpler yeah right but i think it's the same thing it's that in order for you to get up and go get the wrench from across the the garage or whatever you have to actually, it, it's sort of, it's a part of, uh, or you have to context switch. And that's hard to do. You ha I mean, it, it looks really simple. Oh, all you have to do is get up, walk over there, get a wrench. But that's different than what you're doing. If you're already sitting there doing this thing, it's way easier to just continue doing the exact same thing, a little bit harder, and you just keep doing it. But if you have to get up, Walk all the way over there. Find the tool. I mean, that's a different thing. You have to think. You, your brain has to switch. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem like it from far off, but I know in that scenario, weirdly, standing up while uh, or in the middle of something is... There's a lot of effort that goes into that. Yeah. Uh, sounds stupid. But And same thing with the weights. Your, your brain is trying to avoid that context switching. The because when you're lifting weights, you're just in this zone of you and the weights. And it's just easy to bend down and, and do the thing. Well, it's, it's not easy. It's difficult. But in order to go get the jack, you have to switch mindsets from yeah. weightlifting and getting this weight off to go get this jack thing, switch into jack mode, and then, and then do this thing. It, it's different. It requires more brain power. And your brain just wants to avoid that. Yeah, it almost... I think there is a few different things going on, like you said. The in those two examples, like the weights and the the wrench thing, I th think that tends to happen most often when I'm fatigued or frustrated, which mm -hmm. typically pretty fatigued after lifting, so that checks out. The car thing, often I can get very frustrated um, and fatigued doing that, but usually. At the, at the, in the start of the day, early in the morning, if I'm getting going on a project, I don't run into that problem nearly as much. And I think this relates to that kind of broad, diffuse focus versus the very narrow focus in that as you tire or just even get more focused, you tend to get very narrow and you tend to fixate on things. And I think that happens in like these scenarios are or can be examples of fixating on something where I'm fixated on this bolt. I'm angry at it. I hate it. And I just, I want it out. And for some reason, I just can't get my mind to open up again and go, okay, let's take a breath, maybe grab some water, go figure out what the right wrench is going to be. And then we can actually do this rather than just sit here and refuse to give up, even though giving up is the right thing to do. So I and for these specific examples, I think the fixation part is a major piece of it. And as you said, like that, as simple as it is, just trying to get up and force yourself to context, which can be very difficult. So I think that's part of what's going on there. But I do think there's more to it than that, too. Like, 
with what you're talking about, there is this tendency not to really kind of reach in yourself and make those connections where if you have the option of not thinking, that tends to be what you go with. Right. And I guess your examples are sort of this, this smaller, I definitely think it's related and it's very similar, but it, it, it's a smaller thing. Yeah. I think what I'm trying to get at to me, which is the more important thing is. Okay. So in high school, I played a lot of music. I wrote music. I had been playing guitar since I was 10, which actually isn't that long because you're not that old in high school. But right. it seemed like a long time. I I played a lot of music and I wrote a lot of music. And junior year, I did not know how to read music, but I still played it and I still wrote it. And so in, in order to learn how to read music, I decided to take this AP music theory class and we're talking in about high school. Sheet music, right? Like you, you couldn't read sheet music, but you would write music, I assume, in tabs or something or like that. Or just memorize it or yeah. Yeah. I, I mean I could read tabs and stuff, but I couldn't read like Yeah. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. So in order to learn a little bit more about how to read music, I took AP music theory. And in the class, uh, there was a lot of band kids. I, I wasn't in band. Yeah. Um, but I had a lot of band friends and, and whatever. But anyway, in this class, there's a whole bunch of band kids. And before or after the class, when we would have time to just kind of goof around, there was this piano there. And sometimes I would sit down and I would just play songs that I wrote or I'd make something up and I'd just mess around. And most of them, probably not all of them, but most of them would kind of crowd around a little bit and some of them would you know compliment me like man that's so cool it's so great or whatever and you're you're so creative or something and then i remember i would hear a couple of them say things like oh man i can't wait to go to college so i can learn how to write music i can't wait to take a songwriting class so i can learn that or i can't wait to learn so much about music theory that i'll know how to write music in the future and i remember thinking then like what the hell is wrong with you people? You're the real musicians. You guys know way more about music than I do. I'm just, a, I'm a fake. I'm just a kid that just plays stuff. And yet I'm the one sitting there able to write music, not imprisoned by this idea that you have to do it the right way, or you have to know X amount of music theory in order to write. It was like, I just wrote it. I didn't think about it. I just did it. And all of these other kids were jealous of that. And they wished that they could write music. And it just, it kind of drove me crazy. Just thinking that they, it, I didn't understand it. And the ironic thing is that I now am those kids with art a lot of the time. To where I'm thinking, oh, I can't, I can't do that until I, until I get through this whole book on how to do it. Or I can't try to do this until I learn and practice for, you know, another five years or something. I have flipped. Um... And I, I think what happened was that when I started learning music as a, a child of 10 years old, I didn't look to the external world for solutions. I just played and I didn't need anything else. And as an adult, you, you begin to transition from looking to yourself for solutions and you start looking to the outside world for correct ways to do things. And I think, I think if you, the child at the beginning who learns the three notes, if you, the week after you said, here's two more notes. Now you have five notes, write a song with those five notes. They would be ecstatic. Be like, oh, cool. Two more notes I get to play with. If you show the adult, here's two more notes. They think, oh God, two more levels of complexity. Oh, this is so difficult. I, I can't, I can't handle five notes at a time. It's so much harder for them because yeah. they have to live up to this imaginary standard that they think exists. But the child, it's just two more toys in the playground to play with. And so I think that what I am referencing or, or getting at is really just and I think your, your thing is interwoven into this as well, but 
looking to yourself, sort of digging deep into your brain is difficult to do. So you typically, you start to avoid it and go for like the icon of the answer. Like with you searching through the terminal, you recognize it, you know that's right, but you're yeah. not conjuring the understanding of that thing. Well, when a child is a child, they don't have those little icons for what's right and wrong. They only have understanding. They only have, oh, I mean, they only have experience with stuff and they, they make connections. They live in this natural world. That's all they have. As you get older, you start making all of these like icons out of things in order to, to be efficient. I, I think it's, it's a necessary function of your brain to be able to do this. I mean, it, I'm not saying it's wrong all the time, but I think it's just sort of some of these bad things can be a byproduct of simply just becoming an adult. As your brain begins to categorize things, it no longer needs to think about them. And so it can, it can do them or it can recognize them without understanding them. Yeah. So it typically chooses to do the easy thing, which is just recognition. Oh, I know what that is. I know it'll work. Boom, done. You know, you click the button, it's done. Whereas a kid doesn't even have that recognition because it's new. So they're already in their natural world and they just do the thing. So <laughs> this is getting weird. But in, in these metaphors, at least, there are two options. One is look within yourself. The other is recognize something. Search for it in the outside world and use it. The tendency of an adult is to go with the recognition and to search for it in the outside world. And weirdly, this starts to develop into a, a belief in there being a right way and a wrong way to do things. A kid is not able to develop that because they don't develop the recognition until much later. Um, are you still following or is this getting so. too well, weird? No, no, no. I think I'm with you. So first off, I noticed you managed to brag about your musical talents. So we'll call it even. Yeah, when I was 17. I was great when I was 17. Yeah, whatever. Still, you managed to slip it in. So, okay. We'll just say we're even as far as all right, all right, you know, the weights, the music, whatever. Um, so, <laughs> it, it, so it feels a lot like what you're saying. I, I, I can't help but think of you know, however many years ago, 20 years, not 20, 10 or 12 years ago when like phones became a thing and there was just an entire class of conversation that just no longer happened anymore where someone would say, oh, who was that actor in that movie? Or, hey, how do, what do you right, think? Right, when right. was this invented? Like just that never happens because immediately somebody has their phone out, they Google it like, oh, it was, you know, Paris Ford. It was this. You're like, cool. Well, I guess we'll talk about nothing now because... You could try and have someone recall an answer, or figure it out, logic it out, but why? The answer is right there, so you go search for it. And in some sense, that that's the obvious thing. But then at the same time, you're kind of you're losing something where you aren't. I mean, our, our memories are trash now. We've talked about memory yep. plenty, and you would think that having all the information in the world at your fingertips would be amazing, but actually, it's not. It has some pretty big downsides in that. You're never recalling anything, so you're not remembering anything. Yes. So I tried to gesture <laughs> to, yes, you you're correct. I hit my mic. Yeah. So I was having a conversation with my, my friend about this, and we kind of got into a little bit of an argument. First, it started off with AI, him asking me what I thought about AI, and then it yeah, led yeah. or devolved into something else. But I don't want to talk about that. But we got on the subject of he heard this thing and agrees with it that that our phones are basically an extension of our brain now because everyone has them. We always have the phone. Basically, it serves as a piece of our brain. Yeah. And, and so his argument was sort of, not that I don't speak for him, but I'm not saying his name, so I guess it doesn't matter. But he was saying that AI having all of this extra function or extra possibilities, it will only make us even smarter and even better. 
and I could not disagree more. I could not possibly disagree more. Not, not just with the phone, but also, well, adding more information to your within grasp does not make you obtain that information. And we found this. I mean, yeah. humanity has found this. We now have instant access to all kinds of information. And did we get smarter? No, we're actually pretty dumb now. Uh, and one could argue, okay, well, you don't need to be that smart anymore because you have access to all this information. But it, we're getting to a point now where we have so little function, a fucking computer can do it better than us now. Uh, so we're running into some severe issues with memory, with creative thinking, with all kinds of things, because we have handed over our function to our phones, to our computers, to whatever. I'll, I'll try to back up this rant a bit and keep it on the, on the top. Well, let me but... just interject. I also read a, a paper on phones and this, like your friend described it as an extension of yourself. The way I now think of it, this is what this paper was claiming, is that a phone is a pacifier for adults. And yeah, that has just that really sits with me right like yep that's what that is like it's it's an adult wanting to suck on their pacifier by just whatever and i that gotta say that great. that has really helped me put down the phone just trying to create that image of oh i want my phone uh, really has like helped me kind of double down on the you know what i don't think i need my phone anyway continue that's that's no, that, my picture of the phone that is how i view it too. I hadn't thought of pacifier, but that that idea. See, because people will say, you know, now that you're, or or they'll quote Einstein. They'll say, you know, never memorize something you can just look up. Well, that sounds great, okay. And I would love to know the actual context of what he meant yeah. by that, if it was even Einstein who said it. Right. But. The more you pass off to something outside of you, like your phone or computer or whatever, the less your brain needs to do it. And the less your brain needs to do, just like your muscles, the less your muscles do, the less they work. <laughs> okay. So the more yeah. functions you pass off to something else, the less whole you are. Now, of course, that, that comes with many... Uh, many follow-up points of, well, we can't just go back to the Stone Age. You have to adapt. But right. just look at what you are not able to do anymore now that you have a phone or a computer or whatever. There's a big list of things. I can't remember my you know phone numbers of any friends or family anymore. Yeah. Now, you argue, well, that's not important, of course. No, but... That weirdly trickles into everything else. I can't remember numbers hardly at all, yeah. whether they're in my phone or not. They're just really difficult to remember. Same thing with, God, just memory in general. Snap a picture. Oh, it's in my phone. I don't have to think about it. Everything's just there. So you never spend time in your memory anymore. You you take this function and you hand it off to something else. Uh, but... Well, Maybe we should, we should rewind a little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, real quick, though, what's funny about the Einstein example is that and there's a bit of an irony to that because Einstein, you know, he, of course, made his amazing discoveries, observations of, you know, special relativity, general relativity, E equals empty square, that kind of stuff. But he, he wasn't an amazing mathematician. You know, there, there's that story that he got a D in math and high school or something, and that's made up it's not true but he really wasn't like a this math guy he wasn't somebody who just you know worked the math and eventually came up with this astounding result he was somebody who just thought about stuff and he would just think and think and he eventually figured out you know what if you really think about it it doesn't make sense that you could go the speed of light like he just reasoned his way through that and he he thought about it and thought you know what time must slow down as you're going really fast that's just the logical conclusion 
if you consider all of the factors. And he like eventually worked out a way to demonstrate it through math and everything, but he got there by like an extreme example of what you're describing, which is he reached deeply inside himself and he questioned the most fundamental assumptions that literally every other human on earth was assuming, which was that stuff works the way you would think, where you can just go faster and, you know, thing like mass stays the same, stuff like that. He was like, no, it doesn't make sense by thinking so deeply about it. So whatever the context for that quote of, oh, don't remember something, you know, if you can write it down, you know, who knows? But he was somebody who thought so incredibly deeply. That was really his whole thing. So weird, like, don't miss the forest for the trees there, I think, in that example. But either way, I 100% I agree with you. To me, it's very similar to what we're seeing with just bodily health and food. Like we, this is very easy to observe. Pick any statistic you want. I think right now, like at this moment in time, if you're alive, the lifetime incidence risk for type 2 diabetes is like 50% now. Meaning your risk of developing at some point in your life is like, it's accelerating so much that it's probably going to be 50%. Reason being, our environment has been changing so much. And it, as much as I like to say uh, food companies are evil and government health guidelines are evil, mostly what's happening is that there is this natural gravity towards things that are easier and better, like just food wise. We like to eat stuff that's very palatable and you know isn't fatiguing and is easy to get and is calorie dense like we just have this natural gravity towards bad food and it's not really bad it's just stuff that like it's easy it's always there you know we aren't like i i mentioned this last time but you know they're, they're like creating a flame and yawn of this fancy meal is a lot different than just like killing a box of cheese it's but that's just like the natural thing that you tend to do but anyway, that, that's just like the, the gravity of our food environment and we see the effects on people and it's very bad. Like it's really, really bad, especially if you look at the trends over time. And we used to call it the American diet, but now we don't anymore. We call it the Western diet, but really it's the everybody diet. It's the, as, as countries, you know, progress further in food technology and availability, everything trends in this direction. And I think the exact same thing happens with the stuff that involves your brain and mental effort in that we invent something that makes it a lot easier. Hell, we just invented large language models that can store and regurgitate information in a way that we could hardly even fathom just a few years ago. But now we have that. And so we're just, we're headed down this trajectory increasingly. There's just this natural gravity towards it. Like once Google gets invented, then of course everybody uses it. Of course you're not going to sit there and try to recall a fact that nobody's quite sure of because why would you? It's right there. So we just, that's just where we're headed. It's the natural gravity. And in the same way that there's terrible consequences health-wise, I think there's terrible consequences psychologically. And the, the core thing I think that, that you're bringing up, there's this natural tendency to just just search for something. Just go find the piece of information. You don't need to think hard and make those deep connections inside your own brain. That's a lot of work. And if you do a lot of work to get the same result, why would you do it? Like that is not the way a survival oriented human brain is going to work. Like why would a wolf hunt and risk its life and maybe starve if it can just go to the restaurant and the guy just gives it a burger? Of course, like it's stupid. Why would you do that? But the consequence, if you look at that over the long term, can be severe, where you just everything atrophies, you lose all of those abilities because those that's not a given. Like they're they're going to go away. So that's just that's kind of where I'm at with what you're saying, I think. Yeah. Yes. And the other thing is that we tend to isolate like distractions, or we think, you know, if I check my phone. At this point in time, it won't affect me later. Or if I, yeah. you know, if I, I don't know, choose to watch TV right now, you know, tomorrow's a new day, whatever. But what I'm realizing is that the more I give in to instant gratification or I, I take the easy route 
the more my brain wants to take the easy route in every scenario. Yeah. So if you're always getting what you want right away, if you're always being entertained the second you don't feel entertained, uh, then you never... And, and this is why people say boredom is so important, which mm -hmm. it is. It, it forces you to have to start sinking into your deep thinking. Like, you have to start exploring the scary catacombs of your brain. But the more you get instantly gratified, the less likely you are to, to choose the hard route when you need to choose the hard route. And that's why I don't think it's any coincidence that when my computer started shutting off and I stopped using it, all of a sudden I have a breakthrough. It's like my yeah. whole point of view changes because, oh, now I can actually think. Like, I've woken up. Now I can think. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. Yeah. And so, well, yeah, it, it's like you are training your brain at all times. It, there is no isolation. It, it doesn't matter what subject it is. You should treat each thing you do with the same level of respect because whatever you do to your brain in that moment will affect the next moment and the next one and the next one. And it, it's a whole, everything is connected. Every, wanna... Everything is connected connected and if you screw it up in one place you've screwed them all up yeah you want to hear a really terrifying thought this was i was thinking about this recently so i've been for whatever reason just kind of obsessed with health and exercise and that kind of stuff and uh, i'm reading about certain risk factors for you know lifespan longevity and that kind of thing and how I th we all tend to think that the state you're in is the state you're in. You know, if you drink a ton and do drugs and eat really bad and never exercise until you're 45, then you're like, whoop, got to clean it up. And so you put everything back together and you're totally sober and you're exercising and whatever. So on the one hand, yes, you've dramatically improved your odds of not dying for a while, but it's not as if you never did those things. There are a lot of things that are basically accumulated risk. So it, like you almost have to use calculus to understand it in that there's this area under the curve where if, you're, if your body's in a very bad state, you know, all the, the bad numbers are really high, then you're kind of accumulating this risk underneath this curve. And even though it goes back down, and so now the, the risk you're adding is very small, relative to before, you've still built up a lot of risk. And this, you know, affects your risk of cancer and your risk of heart disease and things like that. So there, you know, there's two sides to this. Anybody can improve their health and that's great. But you also, you kind of pay the price. If you smoke for 30 years and then you stop, that's great. You still smoked for 30 years. Like there's still a risk associated with that. Okay. So that's health, right? But Gary thought for me was, what if, what if some of this other stuff operates with the area under the curve problem? What if I spend years being utterly distracted, just doing all kinds of garbage in stuff and browsing Reddit and TikTok and Instagram and just polluting my mind? I've always got this thing in the back of my head, like, it's fine. I'll clean it up, you know? Pretty soon, I'll, you know, I'll be smart and focused and this stuff won't be distracting me. But what if it doesn't work like that? What if it's more of an area under the curve type of problem where that 15 years of just frying your brain turns it into a scrambled egg and that's just that. And you've kind of accumulated that damage over time and doesn't matter how... I mean, you, you stop accumulating the bad things, but you've done the damage. It's just a thought. I don't really have any science to back that up, but it's a very scary thing to me. I feel like science would back it up. But it also would seem to go against what we always say, which is, well, we tend to hold the opinion that you can learn as a child learns as an adult. That's true. And with, if you're saying 
years of being bad <laughs> affects you negatively, well, then that would be a point against the positivity right. to hold as an adult. Um, well, and again, I, it's just a thought that crossed my mind and it made me very scared. And I would also like to mention that it is the 16th and the goal for April was to not unplug my phone and I haven't. And part of that Good has job. been this pacifier thing of like just really thinking of it like my pacifier and the other is kind of that thought of like what if the damage like really is is serious what if this state that i get myself into is really bad i don't want to get down that road too much because again it's just this random thing but it scared me and just wanted to pass along that fear to everybody else well being scared is good if it causes you to make good decisions yeah so fear can be a good thing but i feel I feel like this actually ties into what we were talking about because I, in the past, I don't know, 10 years or however long I've been doing art, I'm, I have always been plagued by this question of, did I start too late? Am I too old? Is my yeah. brain too screwed up from, from not being an artist or whatever? And I've always dealt with that question of, am I good enough? Mm -hmm. But I've started to realize that that way of thinking is me searching for this idea of this some sort of biblical standard or this objective level of quality that actually doesn't exist, especially when, when it is in reference to a creative endeavor. It just doesn't exist because a creative endeavor should be a reflection of a unique individual. It mm -hmm. should be the expression of that person and who i mean the reason why you try to up your quality is so it has more impact but the heart of it is just a person so the more i think about thoughts like that of oh am i too old is it too late i can now view them as red flags of no i'm doing it wrong and yeah. Only an adult would think this way, so don't think that way. Right. <laughs> Only think about what you need to do right now. Um, yeah, I don't know if that point came across as... Yeah. Well, but, I, I, okay, and let's maybe call this a transition point. So let's assume that we have sort of understood and captured this mental effect. Just, yeah, let's, uh, let's pretend that we did a great job. Yeah, 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 well done to us. Um, so <laughs> what are the, what are the things that you're supposed to do about it? I mean, I, I like your example that you originally gave of just looking at how a child approaches something versus an adult. And we've kind of discussed that you could call it a self one, self two type of thing if you want, but you know, we get it. What, what's the solution? Right. How? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I have heard people preaching this type of thing of, you know, not thinking the poisonous thoughts and, you know, focus on what feels good, whatever. And I thought that I understood it, but only until recently do I actually think that I truly have begun to understand this. And I guess what I'm saying is that I cannot give a prescription. I can't give a formula. I cannot show it. I, I can't even describe it in coherent terms, but I'll try to describe what has sort of happened for me. And remember the Tim Galloway thing where Tim Galloway is the author of The Inner Game of Tennis, mm -hmm. which was a genius book. But he's got this video on YouTube, and you can find it, where he teaches these ladies who are self-proclaimed really bad at tennis. <laughs> Like they, they're just exceptionally yeah. awful at tennis. And he's like, come to me. I will teach you how to play. And he brings them to the court in, in a group. I can't remember exactly uh, what, how he ab approaches them, but basically he, he gives zero instruction. Oh, I, no I instruction mean, on, do you remember? Yeah. Oh, I, I love this video. I've watched it a few times. I highly D describe what. Yeah, so he the video is from some news organization. It kind of focuses on one woman in particular who was just 
like picture somebody who you would think would be really bad at sports and this is that person just no i mean what like very nice good humored but this type of person where if she walked into a guitar lesson she'd spend the first 20 minutes going like i can't carry a tune in the bucket i don't know what i'm doing here i don't whatever like just constant vomit of excuses and things like that's just who i picture this being it's just somebody who is really hell-bent on making it clear that they aren't going to be good at this anyway so tim galloway is is teaching her and other people too but the video focuses on her and so he has all these tricks and all these things he does to try and get the person to essentially act like a child and some of the exercises almost seem very childish so he he doesn't explain anything in explicit terms it's one of his big claims is that yeah he and and that's important he yeah. does not talk about tennis okay right. He's not right. giving them the rules of tennis and technique and blah, blah, blah. He just right. does these weird things. Yeah. Okay. Part of his claim is that to make a swing with a tennis racket, you know, that is, what do they call it? Like intrinsic knowledge or something that you can't put into words. Because if, if you took somebody who truly didn't know what a tennis swing looked like and you tried to explain it to them, they would probably probably be nowhere close. Like all the subtle things that your body does is just not something you put into words. You can't capture it. So that's part of his claim. So he has he has her stand there and she's just watching him. And so he has, I think, like a little ball machine hitting balls. And so he's like, just watch me. And he's just like hitting the ball really casually. And he says, OK, I want you to uh, whenever the ball hits the ground, this is still him hitting the ball. And this woman is standing there watching. He says, whenever the ball hits the ground, you say bounce. And whenever I hit the ball with my strings, you say hit. And again, this does not sound like a very adult act, like exercise. So the woman is just going, bounce, hit, bounce, hit, bounce, hit. Sounds kind of silly. And then he's like, okay. And they do that for a little while. Cool. Like now you're going to do it. And what I want you to do is the ball, the, the ball machine is going to hit it. And then you say bounce when it hits the ground. And you say hit when your tennis racket hits it. And so she's standing there. And he's like, he, and he's kind of moving really fast here. He's, you can tell he's trying to get her to not really think about what's happening, to just do this thing. So it's like, okay, here it comes, you know, bounce, hit, bounce, hit. She's like, okay, bounce, hit, bounce, hit. And at first, like the racket is just kind of flailing or whatever, you know, a, a ball kind of fires off on the next court. And he's like, you know, just keep, keep going, like trying to get her to kind of ignore that. And sure enough, like she, she's kind of focused on having to say these words and they're kind of doing two things and he kind of describes this in his book and whatever but part of it is that it's hard to get too self-conscious if you're focused on something else she's having to say these words and kind of keep her her conscious mind engaged with the activity so it's harder to start becoming you know very self-aware and then the other is that because she was doing this when he was hitting the ball and she's also doing this when she's hitting the ball, it's creating this sort of mimicry where it's this familiar pattern of bounce, hit, bounce, hit. And so she's just engaging that same pattern where she's just mimicking him, trying to do what she saw him do. And he goes through a few exercises that are kind of similar to this, but by the end of it, with one session, 20, 30 minutes or something, they do like a 15 point rally or something, which as somebody who has spent plenty of time playing and coaching tennis, that's pretty fantastic. I mean, hardly anybody can get to that point, even if they're, you know, very athletic and full of confidence. I mean, this woman did extremely well. And his whole philosophy was not to give instruction the way you would typically give instruction. It was to try and create this environment where she's mimicking and just observing and replicating and doing these little silly things. And he, he describes the tennis serve like a dance, you know, and she's supposed to do the dance the way he's doing the dance. Serve is very difficult and she, she gets it. She starts serving. It's going in. It was amazing. Highly recommended. Everybody should watch that video. Yeah. I feel like I found Jesus and his name is Tim Galway. <laughs> Because I, he just, he describes this stuff so yeah. well, and that's what I'm experiencing. Now, okay, so take the old guy from the, the three-note example at the beginning, okay? Uh, 
an adult, an adult guy. I didn't know he was and an old guy, but sure. I, I guess in my head, he's an old guy. There's a specific student that I'm thinking of Okay. when I think of him. But anyway, take this guy. And instead of teaching him, okay, this is a C, this is a D, and this is an E, and you're going to write a song now. Right. Uh, you know, whatever. Instead, be like, okay, hit this, and then hit this one. Okay, now hit whichever one you want. All right, now play them backwards or just, you know, you just, yeah. you, you keep him just moving, moving. And then before you know it, if you're smart about it, he's writing a song in front of you without mm -hmm. him thinking that he's writing a song. He's just doing it. Oh, man. And that's what you have to do. <laughs> that uh, was, sorry, but that, I just remember well before I had really thought about this stuff, like too, too clearly, even then, that's what I figured out I had to do, which was if you had an adult and you wanted to try to get them to start improvising or doing any kind of writing or something, you had to trick them. You had to, yeah. it's like cooking a frog in the water where you'd say, okay, I'm going to play this thing and I want you to like play quarter notes with this note. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, no, I want you to just like do some half notes or something. I'm like, okay, now just kind of mix it up. You pick whether you want to do a quarter note or half note. Like you're literally just getting them to play a single note and to choose between two different you know note durations and that's how you get them started where they're genuinely having to make a musical choice and then you slowly build it out from there and you never tell them that we're trying to improvise or compose or anything you just have to sort of trick them until they start you know okay now you have these two notes you get to decide and they start coming up with stuff and it can even get really exciting for them but if you let the adult brain start to sink in or take over it's all forget it you're back to nothing right you have to conjure all the natural stuff that you already know how to do yeah. so uh, the, the question becomes how do you trick yourself you can trick someone else if you know better but how do you do it to yourself and i i don't have a secret but i feel like okay, this uh every time i'm about to explain it, i like jump to another example but I've been playing these shows with this band from work, right? We talked about that before. And we've played a couple shows before. It's just a little work band, whatever. It's not anything crazy. But for the band, I have to learn a certain amount of songs and, you know, guitar solos, solos whatever. And so I have to, to practice guitar again, which I haven't played much guitar in years because I've been focused on art stuff. So I, I have largely treated it uh, very surface level, very, okay, I'll practice the song and then I'll just get out, you know, yeah. play guitar for a little bit because I'm afraid of conjuring up all those like deep feelings with guitar and music. It's like, I, I don't want to try again. I just want to, yeah. you know, do the chore, get it over with and then move on because yeah. I, you know, it's like a small talk with, with the next lover or something. Like you, you don't want to conjure any deep feelings. You just, you're just talking surface level. So I I play the guitar, I practice the stuff, and then I put it down, and I try not to think about anything, anything deeper, anything like that. And so that's how, how, how I've been treating it. But recently, with all the art stuff feeling like really good, and of course, it's gone up and down and blah, blah, blah. I've run into all kinds of issues, whatever. But my my way of thinking now is really whenever things get bad, I have to just kind of find my way back to this feeling, to this spot where it feels good again. And that's the practice now. It's not so much about finding this super secret piece of knowledge that once I have that, I'll be a, a real artist. Yeah. It's more about, okay, just find your way back to feeling good. So with the guitar, I'm like, I wonder if I could just play music again and feel good without any sort of deep emotional baggage attached to it what if i just played and enjoyed it set it down pick up the sketchbook again and and you know go from one to the other without a second thought just enjoy both of them so i pick up my guitar and it's not like i haven't touched my guitar in a while but i pick it up and i'm thinking okay what if just like art i just focused on the feeling you know the the bounce hit bounce hit like you that's it that simple that dumb and you, I picked up the guitar and I was like, okay, I'll just play one note until it feels really good. So I just sit there and play the note and you just kind of focus on the feeling. Nothing else, just the feeling. And then once you feel good, you play another note. Oh, that was fun. And then all of a sudden I'm just playing guitar and it's really fun. And 
that's it. That that was the secret. Yeah. And I played guitar for an hour and a half, just making stuff up and playing old songs and just feeling music like I haven't felt in a decade. It was really weird and amazing. And it was great. That's cool. And all it took was me just focusing on the feeling in a very dumb way. It's funny because I think God, I think all of education just has it backwards. I th I think we're all wrong. Just the way we go about learning things, I think we are completely wrong. I think it's all backwards. We, not, not everyone in the world, but pretty much. Think about all the issues we have. Think about the big mainstream issues that everyone has. Perfectionism, procrastination, dealing with distractions, you know, feeling uh, imposter imposter syndrome uh you know people trying to kill themselves to be good enough to whatever like everyone feels inadequate in their knowledge everyone feels like they're not good enough they just have this avalanche of stuff that they need to learn this is probably a different episode <laughs> but but yeah. i think we have it backwards in that we ignore this childlike playfulness because it's really hard to talk about and actually it's really dumb like it's mm -hmm. stupid like there's no intellectual achievement unlocked by acting like a child there's no sort of bragging rights to saying yeah i just played because i liked it like there, there's there's nothing there to latch on to so it's completely overlooked and yet i think it is the absolute heart of everything you do in pretty much anything it, yeah, I, I can't help but think about the memory stuff. And I know we beat this drum all the time, but if you look at, I'll try to give the brief take on this. If you look at the memory competitors, the people who memorize you know, eight decks of cards in 30 minutes and can recall all of that or pages and pages of phone numbers, or they're doing stuff where most people, when they see that, they either think, I didn't know that was possible, like that's just an entirely new concept to me, or these people are some kind of freakish superhuman. You know, they have some weird thing right. that must have happened with their brain, Rain Man type stuff, and they have this superhuman memory, like their brain is wired differently. And the truth is that none of those are true. There's an entire book called Moonwalking with Einstein that I really, really enjoyed of... Uh, Joshua Foer, I think his name is, he, he goes to one of these things. One of the competitors says, no, you could learn to do this. Like, this is just technique. And he goes, no way, that's absurd. And the guy convinces him and so he does and he later on wins the memory competition. So it's purely a normal person thing. But what's amazing about that is that the techniques that you learn to do this stuff are silly. You, you picture... Right weird goofy things in your mind some of them are just dumb some of them are violent some of them are you know sexual or whatever but that's how you make things memorable you can turn a number something that's very hard to remember into a series of sounds and you can take those sounds and create words and you could you know come up with all kinds of silly scenarios like the monkey ran and you know stabbed somebody and that like lets you your mind pictures this thing and it conjures up some number that's seemingly random but here's my point we knew this a long time ago it was well established that this was how you remembered stuff was you used these techniques of making it memorable which seems tautologically obvious of course to remember things you try to make it memorable but we knew this and we taught it in schools and eventually in this sort of puritanical environment it was decreed that this was silly and weird and sacrilegious or some sort of blasphemy and it was purged from schools where you just nope we are not going to teach this anymore no more memory right. techniques it's too weird don't like it and then it's just this forgotten thing where you have to dig into some weird corner of the internet and go, oh, look at all these techniques to remember stuff. Now, I know there's criticisms of that, like, okay, how useful is it, this or that, whatever. It's not the point. The point is that we used to get this, but because of its silliness, 
we just got rid of it. And we said, nope, we're serious now. We're going to do serious stuff. And now nobody can remember anything. And I, that's something that's very clear and easy to demonstrate. And so that allows you to go, okay, yeah, we see the value in these techniques, even if they are silly. But for something that's not as clear and harder to demonstrate, as you said, just this thing in your mind of, I just want to play and enjoy and discover and recapture that mindset. You can't really test that and put it on display and say, yes, this proves that this silly childish mindset is the way to think. But that doesn't mean that it isn't valid or extremely important for anybody making these discoveries and, and doing well and progressing in their own music. I, I guess what I'm saying is that if you just look at how society thinks, our culture, we inherently do not value those things that feel kind of silly. You can, you can see that over time. But that doesn't mean that they aren't valuable. They probably are. I'm, you know, we're making the argument that they are. But they're discarded because they're not, they're not hardcore. You can't test them. Well, okay. Imagine, I'll try to make this quick. Imagine this, this big dining hall and all of us are, are sitting in the dining hall and it, it's pretty epic. Uh, and then Hogwarts. in the middle, what? I'm picturing Hogwarts. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yes. I think I am too. Okay. Uh, picture we're in this dining hall at, at Hogwarts and all of a sudden this ghost appears just out of the corner of the room. This amazing, uh, magical, beautiful ghost. It appears and it starts floating around the room and we're all like, wow. What is going on? And then the ghost starts inscribing things on the wall, starts writing on the wall. And it's this beautiful, extravagant thing. And we're all just in awe. We're like, wow, this is gorgeous. This is amazing. And then the ghost disappears and the writing is left on the wall. So everyone gets up and we all go look at the wall. And in an attempt to understand it and appreciate it more, we start taking out, you know, measuring sticks and protractors and whatever, and we start documenting everything on the wall. And you know, we measure every tiny little thing until we have this record of it. And then, then we put together books and we start making rules about, oh, this is, you know, this is how you do this thing that the ghost did. And we understand it now. And no, you're, you're doing it wrong. You have to do it this way because we figured it out and whatever. And we developed this whole set of rules for this the remnants of something that was done by this magical being. We develop music theory. We develop rules of art. We develop all of mm -hmm. these things based off of this remnant of, of something that occurred. We look at Beethoven or Mozart. And we're like, these are the rules they used. Let's study those. And we look at Einstein and we think, oh, he knew all about math or he knew this equation and he figured this thing out and he's just a total genius whatever but we're forgetting that the magic is gone i mean the magic was the person that did the thing and we can't understand that like the magic was the ghost that did the thing and let's say the ghost comes out again and inscribe something else on the wall. And it's totally different. And we're like, oh my God, we know nothing. We know yeah. nothing at all. This completely throws everything off. And I think what's happening with someone like, stop me if you stop following, but someone like Einstein or Beethoven or Mozart, we study what they did, but we really, we try to understand them, but we can't. It's impossible. It's this weird magical thing which is human nature you cannot understand it because it's it's not something that can be described coherently and the thing with someone like einstein it's probably not that he was just some ridiculous genius it could be as simple and as dumb as the fact that he just really liked to daydream 
and really enjoyed thinking about things. And it just so happened that he was, there was a way that certain pieces of information got caught up in that very simple thing that he just enjoyed doing. And then these results happen that we study endlessly. And we think this guy was a genius, but really it could be just as simple as he loved to daydream. Like I, that's I, it. I think that is what happened. I think you can you can read about that with Einstein in particular, that he he really was just somebody who was obsessed and who just really couldn't stop thinking about, man, what happens if you go really fast? Or I really think right. that is the case. I think you're spot on. Uh so you know, we, to, we got three uh, minutes, so we gotta gotta well, bring it together. To answer your question of what do you do? What how do you search for answers within yourself? Because I, I think we lose that as an adult or as an adult. But to search within yourself for the answer is to find at least for me, I have found places to let go of all and this is not easy to do but you let go of all pre-existing thoughts of of technique of things that you are supposed to be completely forget about all of that as best you can and it gets easier with time uh both in long-term practice but also just you keep doing this after 20, 30 minutes, eventually you kind of get in to the right place. But you f you find a place where you can completely forget about all technique, all right and wrongs and all that stuff, and you only focus on... There goes my alarm. we got one minute. You only focus on the feeling. You only focus on what you want out of that thing. And you practice in all different disciplines. You practice finding that one spot like that place that just feels good the the childlike feeling of just feeling good just focus on that do something as stupid as say bounce hit whatever like yeah it's that dumb yeah yeah we got it all wrong but okay we got like 30 <laughs> seconds so okay my closing thought the solution to the first one in the game effect is very simple it's to play the game by yourself is to be if you aren't the first one in the game you need to play it, be the only one in the game. And that puts you in an environment where you have to rely on yourself. And I think the same logic applies here. Find that environment, put yourself there. Okay, we gotta go. Your computer's about to shut off, goodbye.